Well, good evening, everybody, and welcome to our evening prayer service for this, the sixth Sunday in Easter. And also, uh, although not a, in the church calendar, of course, uh, in our culture, it's also Mother's Day. Uh, if you have a prayer book at home and would wish to follow along and pray with me, the service begins on page 18. I was glad when they said unto me, Let us go into the house of the Lord. Dearly beloved, the scripture moveth us in sundry places to acknowledge and confess our manifold sins and wickedness, and that we should not dissemble nor cloak them before the face of Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, but confess them with a humble, lowly, penitent, and obedient heart to the end that we may obtain forgiveness of the same by his infinite goodness and mercy. And although we ought at all times humbly to acknowledge our sins before God, yet ought we most cheaply so to do when we assemble and meet together to render thanks for the great benefits that we have received at his hands, to set forth his most worthy praise, to hear his most holy word, and to ask those things which are requisite and necessary as well for the body as the soul. Wherefore, I pray and beseech you, as many as are here present, to accompany me with a pure heart and humble voice unto the throne of the heavenly grace. Almighty and most merciful Father, we have erred and strayed from thy ways like lost sheep. We have followed too much the devices and desires of our own hearts. We have offended against thy holy laws. We have left undone those things which we ought to have done. And we have done those things which we ought not to have done. And there is no health in us. But thou, O Lord, have mercy upon us, miserable offenders. Spare thou them, O God, which confess their faults. Restore thou them that are penitent, according to thy promises declared unto mankind in Christ Jesus our Lord. And grant, O most merciful Father, for his sake, that we may hereafter live a godly, righteous, and sober life, to the glory of thy holy name. Amen. And Almighty God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who desireth not the death of a sinner, but rather that he may turn from his wickedness and live, hath given power and commandment to his ministers to declare and pronounce to his people, being penitent, the absolution and remission of their sins. He pardoneth and absolveth all them that truly repent and unfeignedly believe his holy gospel. Wherefore we beseech him to grant us true repentance and his Holy Spirit, that those things may please him which we do at this present, and that the rest of our life hereafter may be pure and holy, so that at the last we may come to his eternal joy, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive them that trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. And O Lord, open thou our lips, and our mouth shall show forth thy praise. O God, make speed to save us. O Lord, make haste to help us. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen.
Praise ye the Lord. The Lord's name be praised. The psalm assigned for this, the sixth Sunday in Easter, is Psalm 98, uh, found on page 455. O oh, sing unto the Lord a new song, for he hath done marvelous things. With his own right hand and with his holy arm hath he gotten himself the victory. The Lord hath declared his salvation. His righteousness hath he openly shown in the sight of the nations. He hath remembered his mercy and his faithfulness toward the house of Israel. And all the ends of the world have seen the salvation of our God. Show yourselves joyful unto the Lord, all ye lands. Sing, rejoice, and give thanks. Praise the Lord upon the harp. Sing to the harp with the psalm of thanksgiving. With trumpets also and the sound of the horn. O oh, show yourselves joyful before the Lord the King. Let the sea make a noise and all that is therein, the round world and they that dwell therein. Let the floods clap their hands and let the hills be joyful together before the Lord. For he is come to judge the earth. With righteousness shall he judge the world and the peoples with equity. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Ghost as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. The first lesson is written in the book of the prophet Hosea. Chapter 11, beginning to read at the first verse. When Israel was a child, I loved him. And out of Egypt I called my son. The more I called them, the more they went from me. They kept sacrificing to the Baals and offering incense to idols. Yet it was I who taught Ephraim to walk. I took them up in my arms, but they did not know that I healed them. I led them with cords of human kindness, with bands of love. I was to them like those who lift infants to their cheeks and bent down to them and fed them. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. On page 21 we say the Magnificat. My soul doth magnify the Lord and my spirit hath rejoiced in God my Savior. For he hath regarded the lowliness of his handmaiden. For behold, from henceforth all generations shall call me blessed. For he that is mighty hath magnified me, and holy is his name. And his mercy is on them that fear him throughout all generations. He hath showed strength with his arm. He hath scattered the proud in the imagination of their hearts. He hath put down the mighty from their seat, and hath exalted the humble and meek. He hath filled the hungry with good things, and the rich he hath sent empty away. He, remembering his mercy, hath hope in his servant Israel, as he promised to our forefathers Abraham and his seed forever. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. And the second lesson is written in the 15th chapter of the Gospel according to St. John, beginning to read at the ninth verse. As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments, and abide in his love. I have said these things to you so that my joy may be in you, and that your joy may be complete. 
This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. No one has greater love than this, to lay down one's life for one's friend. You are my friends if you do what I command you. I do not call you servants any longer because the servant does not know what the master is doing. But I have called you friends because I have made known to you everything that I have heard from my father. You did not choose me, but I chose you. And I appointed you to go and bear fruit, fruit that will last, so that the Father will give you whatever you ask him in my name. I am giving you these commands so that you may love one another. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Page 22, we say the Nunc Dimittis. Lord, now let us thou, thy servant, depart in peace according to thy word. For mine eyes have seen thy salvation, which thou hast prepared before the face of all people, to be a light to lighten the Gentiles, and to be the glory of thy people Israel. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. And I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell, the third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. And the Lord be with you and with thy spirit. Let us pray. Lord, have mercy upon us. Christ, have mercy upon us. Lord, have mercy upon us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive them that trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. And, o Lord, show thy mercy upon us, and grant us thy salvation. O Lord, save the Queen, and mercifully hear us when we call upon thee. Endue thy ministers with righteousness, and make thy chosen people joyful. O Lord, save thy people, and bless thine inheritance. Give peace in our time, O Lord, and evermore mightily defend us. O God, make clean our hearts within us, and take not thy Holy Spirit from us. No God, from whom all holy desires, all good counsels, and all just works do proceed, give unto thy servants that peace which the world cannot give, that our hearts may be set to obey thy commandments, and also that by thee, we being defended from the fear of our enemies, may pass our time in rest and quietness through the merits of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Enlighten our darkness, we beseech thee, O Lord, and by thy great mercy defend us from all perils and dangers of this night for the love of thy only Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be now and always acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. 
Amen. A uh, cute little anecdote that I think is fitting for today, uh, Mother's Day. Somebody calls and little Johnny picks up the phone uh, and says, Mom's in the hospital and the twins and Rosie and Sally and Peter and the dog and the cat and dad and me. We're all alone here at home. Um, I think the sentiment of this little boy might capture what Jesus means in our gospel reading tonight by abiding, by abiding in God's love, by abiding in Jesus. Um, it's true that Jesus goes on in the reading to clearly say that abiding in him, abiding in God's love, uh, cannot be disassociated with loving others. And perhaps that's the complete and utter definition of abiding in Christ's love, is being full of love ourselves uh, for others uh, and for Christ. But I do think the little boy's feeling nervous, scared, alone, without his mother close by, surely connects to our Lord's admonition that we abide in Him, that we abide in God, that we find our sense of peace and purpose and fortress and foundation and and just the framework, the best, the only good framework for our lives in abiding in, in Christ. And you may say that, oh, you're being too sentimental, you're being too emotional, uh, maybe you're trying to make God uh, you know, too anthropomorphic, uh, uh, our divine God who's beyond our, uh, our finite minds to comprehend. It's not appropriate to, to uh, size him down, <laughs> if, as you were, to a human parent. And maybe there is some truth to this, I'm just being sentimental and undervaluing the, the majesty of God. But on the other hand, the Bible does this itself. Um, in Hosea, the prophet Hosea, speaking, I guess, for God, or God speaking through the prophet Hosea, says to the people of Israel, he says to them, I love you. I am there for you uh, like a mother or a father or a parent holding an infant and putting them close to my face, cheek to cheek. And I suspect that the prophet Hosea had in mind, in this metaphor, a mom holding her little infant cheek to cheek. And Hosea, or God through Hosea goes on to say that, that he was the one that bent down and fed Israel like a parent feeds a child. And in the New Testament, Jesus himself, when Coming into Jerusalem, or in Jerusalem, sees the crowds of people and laments. Uh, historians, and biblical historians like N.T. Wright think that Jesus 
is anticipating, is, is realizing, is knowing that Jerusalem is going to be totally uh, destroyed, raised, uh, and leveled with unbelievable human suffering and pain. And in response, Jesus says, I wish I could hold you in my arms like a mother hen surrounds her chicks, her brood, with her wings. I think it is fair to say that abiding in God, abiding in Christ, surely is like this kind of love. This video you will watch on Sunday or later, but it was recorded on Thursday. And I had Bible study at 11 and noonday prayers at 12. And then, um, so I didn't have lunch and I had to dash off to take something to a parishioner who was not able to leave her apartment. Uh, and it was a heavy parcel, so I offered to pick it up and take it to her. And then I had to go from there to somewhere else. And I was just about to take off when I see Gord's uh, SUV, familiar SUV, come in the driveway and stop by the food bank uh, door. And the door was open. So it didn't take a uh, genius to figure out that he had gotten a big food bank order. And I thought, well, I wouldn't be abiding in Christ's love very much if I didn't love Gord and get out of the car and help him unload. And I'm glad I did that for two reasons. One is, um, there were heavy boxes, really heavy boxes, so I was glad to help Gord out. But the second reason was, some of the not heavy boxes were full of chocolate chip muffins and delicious looking chocolate chip cookies, particularly when breakfast was like around 6.30 in the morning. And I had been jogging and walking the dog. Those chocolate chip cookies looked really good and I made some kind of, just sort of a little hint and all wouldn't you know it, uh, one of those chocolate chip cookie boxes ends up in with me. <laughs> Not like a huge Costco one, uh, but 12. A dozen big chocolate chip cookies. And I ate them all on my way to my errands uh, for lunch. And you know, I think I could honestly say it that um, I could blame my mother. Now, she'd be angry at me, of course, if she knew that all I had for lunch was 12 cookies. She would have wanted some vegetables and some fruit and maybe just half of one of those big cookies uh, for lunch, not all 12 of them. I might have heard it about that. But, uh, but it's also her fault because she was a great cook and she loved to make chocolate chip cookies and ginger snaps and all oh, the best chocolate cake with boiled icing and so many other things. Uh, and I particularly love the chocolate chip cookies and I would eat them all, they come right out of the oven. There's nothing better than homemade chocolate chip cookies right out of the oven. The smell, the taste, the texture. And she'd get mad at me and Esther gets mad at me when I eat them all right away. And they say, you should save some for the next day and the next time I say, why? Why, why eat them when they don't taste as good? That's enjoy them all right now to the point where my mom would hide them in the dishwasher and all over the house. I love those chocolate chip cookies. And you know, I think I could be accused of being a mom's boy. I know I could be accurately found guilty for being a mother's boy. Uh, uh, when university at Wycliffe College, I don't know, I was 23, 24, a man, a grown man, and after the class, just before, the, or just, you know, when the mail would come, I'd beat it out of the classroom, I'd go right to the Porter's Lodge, or whatever they call it, where we would get the mail, and there would often be a big box full of chocolate chip cookies. And they may not have been 
fresh out of the oven, but they were still really good. And for a short while, I was very popular on campus <laughs> and just devour these cookies. And of course, they tasted good. But especially the care package, it's right in the title, eh? right in the name. The care package from home, from mom. It was more than just the delicious taste. It was a way of abiding in her and in her love. You know, when I was a little boy, only as an adult have I, in hindsight, realized how sick I was uh, with very serious asthma attacks and pneumonia just about every winter. Uh, I knew I could hardly breathe, but I never thought I might be dying. But I suspect my mother was worried about that. And I remember her just holding me uh, and rubbing my forehead. And to this day, I love to have my forehead <laughs> rubbed. And there were so many other ways uh, that I abided in her, in her love. And I think, I think it's fair to say that this kind of love is what Jesus is getting at when he says, abide in me, abide in my love. Of course, the problem is, many people have perhaps not experienced this kind of love in their lives. Uh, for many people, Mother's Day is a very painful day. It can be a painful day because their mothers and fathers abandon them, either literally or emotionally. Uh, or worse than that, we're cruel to them. Or some people wished like anything to be a mother and never had that opportunity. And then there are people like myself who miss their mom and their dad. And for them, this day uh, is bittersweet. And, and this reminds us that as followers of Jesus, our, our purpose, our meaning, our fortress, our foundation for life is not any person or anything else for that matter. You know, Recently, I've experienced uh, quite a lot of anger, <laughs> uh, people being angry. And it seems to me that many of this, these cases of anger have derived from the fact that the people are insecure in themselves and they hate for the sources of their insecurity to be identified or to be open to public viewing. And so one of the ways of protecting themselves is to be angry and to guard themselves. You know the Simon and Garfunkel song, I am a rock, I am an island, you know, nobody gets inside. And I know what that feeling is like. I am useless with uh, carpentry, or building, or drawing, or fixing things, or making things. I am absolutely useless. If I signed up for a Habitat for Humanity, I would be happy and maybe only able to lug the lumber from point A to point B. I could do that. I could do that all day. I'd be happy to do that menial job. 
but give me anything more responsible or more creative uh, and I would probably run away. In fact, I remember, I remember, in fact, it was a Mother's Day event at the school where Kathleen, her elementary school, uh, and I think it was like, they got the grade eight girls and it, dads, I don't know, it was Father's Day, I guess. Yeah, it was actually Father's Day. And the, it was a competition to build a bridge out of uh, popsicle sticks and a few elastics and a few other little things and to see how many pennies could sit on our bridge. Meanwhile, right beside me was a little girl that, or not, uh, 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 actually a boy, uh, Kathleen's age, we knew them, whose dad couldn't come but whose mother was an engineer and she built like the bridge, the San Francisco Bridge. Uh, you know, just this amazing thing. And I couldn't help Kathleen do anything. And I wanted out of there so bad. It was the most horrible thing that I could have done uh, with Kathleen to mark Father's Day. Why couldn't we have just gone to a ball game or something? And I wanted out of there. I wanted out of there. I felt humiliated. I felt... I really felt uh, useless, terrible. Ironically, I, at least I think, maybe you don't, but I think I am pretty good at public speaking. And even if I'm not very good at it, it does not scare me at all. And ironically, the two things that people are most scared of is death and public speaking. And it doesn't bother me at all. But as I've been saying, at length, anything like that bridge building contest, and I'm out of there. And it just goes to show you that, that we need something perfect, something solid, something great, perfect love to base our lives upon, to be our foundation. Uh, not our parents, even if they were wonderful parents. Uh, not anything else. Um, Timothy Keller, who is a very prolific author in the evangelical Christian world, he writes all kinds of books, but no matter what the topic is, he seems to always come around to this point. He even quotes non-Christian philosophers who make his argument for him in many ways. And in a book that I'm reading now, he quotes a, a non-Christian, uh, I think a non, an atheist philosopher, who talks about uh, worship and that whatever we worship is going to let us down. And I just want to read it to you, this quote from Timothy Keller's book. In the day-to-day -day trenches of adult life, there is no such thing as not worshiping. Everybody worships. The only choice we get is what to worship. And an outstanding reason for choosing some sort of God or spiritual thing to worship is that pretty much anything else you worship will eat you alive. If you worship money and things, if they are where you tap real meaning in life, then you will never have enough. Never feel you have enough. Worship your own body and beauty and sexual allure, and you will always feel ugly. And when time and age start showing, you will die a million deaths before they finally plant you. Worship power. You will end up feeling weak and afraid, and you will need ever more power over others to keep the fear at bay. Worship your intellect. Being seen as smart, you will end up feeling stupid, a fraud, always on the verge of being 
found out. But the good news for you and I, as followers of Jesus, is that we get to abide in Him. We get to abide in His love. We get to abide in His love on the cross and in His resurrection. And nothing can destroy that fortress or shake that foundation. And whether or not we have had loving parents, whether or not we have been successful at anything or many things in life, we know that we can abide in God's love. The love that picked up a little child and put her next to the cheek or bent down low and fed a little boy. May this be a source of joy today for you. Amen. Let us pray. Gracious God, we do thank you for your many blessings. We thank you for mothers. We thank you for those who have loved us as a parent, maybe a teacher, a counselor, a coach, a neighbor, another relative, a good friend. And we pray for families. We pray for parents. Pray for them, particularly in this pandemic, as they seek to care for their children under very stressful circumstances. Lord, help them. Help them to be good parents. And uh, we pray for children. Pray for them especially as they have to learn over a computer and they may feel isolated from their friends, peers. We really pray for them. And we do pray for, for, for an end to this pandemic, Lord. We particularly uphold in our prayers the people of India and other developing nations and nations that are suffering from enormous cases and pain and death and shortages of supplies and professionals. And um, we pray for our frontline workers and we pray for... Um, uh, essential workers and Lord we give thanks we give thanks to you for loving us so much and help us Lord to abide in that love and, and may that mean that we are loving towards others uh, even those that we don't like or consider even enemies we know that abiding in your love means loving everyone Help us to do this. Help us to wish and desire and to act in the best interests of everyone we encounter. And we ask these prayers in Jesus' name. Amen. And may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you and those you love this night and forevermore. Amen. God bless.